evening, everyone. My name is Baptiste, and with Emma, we are really happy to welcome you on our new show, Road to Space. We are live from Paris tonight to cover the launch of two very special and innovative satellites, one from Utelsat, the other from Embratel. This, of course, possible thanks to Ion Space, Ion Group, the CNES, and the European Space Agency. That's right, Baptiste, and we have a very exciting program lined up for you all tonight. In less than 30 minutes, the European launcher, Ariane 5, will be taking off from the European Space Center in Kourou. We will be live from Ariane's main base of operations over there and be giving you privileged access inside the Jupiter control room for some exclusive behind the scene coverage. And here in the Paris studio with Emma, we will receive and interview some space leading experts. We'll do our best to reply to all the questions we receive via social networks. But before that, let's take a look at tonight's menu. Tonight in Road to Space, we'll be live from Guyana Space Center with all the team. We are here, of course, to witness the launch of the Ariane 5 rocket, which will be sending two telecommunication satellites into orbit. Star 1 D2, in three words, multi-mission, high performance, and connectivity. Here in the Paris studio, we'll be talking to Space's top experts about the launch and showing you video reports on what the future holds for satellites. Quantum is at heart the start of the revolution. You will learn how a telecommunication satellite works and will be giving you an exclusive look into the latest advances of the new European rocket Ariane 6. Je vous propose de le découvrir de l'intérieur. We'll also be answering all your questions on social networks and looking at the film Stowaway to find out if an intruder really could sneak his way aboard a rocket. But more than this, we hope that with Road to Space, you will spend a truly magical and unique night in our company where Earth meets space and the present embraces the future. Welcome aboard Road to Space. And so we're really happy to be with you tonight. And let's go directly to uh, Kourou to meet our um, special first guest, Ariane Space CEO, Stefan Israel. You're waiting for us. Hello, Stefan. Welcome to Road to Space. Uh, just one question. I see you're all on the deck getting ready for this upcoming flight. And it's a very special one. It's the Ariane 5, the European Heavy Launcher. Yes, it is a very special uh, launch tonight. It is the first launch of the year with Ariane 5. And we have on board two long-lasting partners of Ariane Space. We have with Star 1 D2 the operator Ambratel. We have launched all the satellites of Ambratel. And the other uh, partner is uh, our long-lasting uh, friend Utelsat. We have started our relationship in 1983. So with Star 1 D2 and with Quantum, we have really uh, long-lasting uh, partners to night on board an iron five yeah two special guests two special passengers for you and uh, in a way the launching this launching is the climax of this campaign For sure, so we are now a few minutes before the launch and you know for uh, having the liftoff at 6 o'clock p.m. Guyana time tonight, we need the satellite to be ready, we need the launcher to be ready, we need also the weather to be with us. We have now the final minutes up to the launch. We have a lot of very important operations to do before lifting off. So let's see how things are going to turn out and uh, we are confident for the liftoff. We wish you good luck. We're sure everything is going to be uh, perfect. Thank you very much, Stefan. We'll come back to you a little bit later. And for all of you watching live, we will, of course, come back to Kourou regularly to inform you. But for now, let's welcome Amandine Lux, who's just joined us into the studio. Good evening. Good evening, Amandine. Good evening, Emma. Good evening, Baptiste. Welcome to Road to Space. You are Ariane Space's Advanced Studies Director, and tonight you will be connected with Kourou, thanks to a little earpiece, and giving us regular updates throughout the program about the mission. But can you explain to us, firstly, what are the principal stages of the mission? Yes, so we can have a look. Uh, we have uh, a little animation, so we can have an overview of what we are going to witness uh, tonight. So at HCO, an important event, we will have the main stage uh, engine ignition. And so after a few healthy checks, uh, it will be followed by uh, the ignition of the boosters. So I'm waiting. We'll be getting some images yeah. up yeah, on the I'm screen Yeah, I'm waiting soon. for the animation. 
Ah, okay. We should see this, uh, this animation. Well, In normally it should appear on the... Here on it the is. Yeah, so yeah, that's it. So you, it. you will have the liftoff uh, with the booster's uh, ignition. And uh, after a quick ascent phase, uh, the launch vehicle will perform uh, the pitch uh, maneuver in order to get uh, to the white right direction. A few seconds later, after, uh, when they are no longer needed, the booster are separated from uh, the launch vehicle. And after that, we will separate the fairing, which protect the satellites, when it's no longer needed, once the launch vehicle uh, reaches out uh, the atmosphere. So the main uh, stage propel phase goes on till we reach the intermediate orbit. At this stage, we cut off the main stage engine, uh, you have a distancing uh, maneuver, and uh, there will be the ignition of uh, the upper stage engine after the separation of the main stage. So this second propel phase goes on till we reach the final orbit, the injection orbit, and tonight for our customers it will be the GT orbit, the geotransfer orbit. Uh, the same as for the main stage, uh, the engine uh, will cut off, we cut off when we reach the final orbit and we enter then the ballistic phase to which we will separate our customers. So first tower and D2 and after a few maneuvers of distancing we will separate the dual launch structure because we have a second passenger and so after the sealed air separation, this dual launch structure, we will separate our second passenger, Eutelsat Quantum. Okay, so those are all the points we have to follow, uh, especially with you. And so you, you will be the one commenting with us all those key points uh, happening during uh, the launcher, the launching. Um, uh, but uh, well, thank you very much, Amandine. You stay with us. We'll come back to you shortly after. But uh, before we have, uh, we, are, we are going to take a look at Star 1D2, one of those two satellites that will be launched tonight. Star 1D2 will improve access to high quality entertainment and information services in Central and South America and it will also connect undeserved population. Let's have a look at the report. I would describe Star 1D2 as powerful, hybrid and four-band satellites. Multi-mission, high performance and connectivity. Star 1D2 is the largest satellite ever launched for Ombretel. It is the latest in a fleet of 12 satellites. Its role? To boost the coverage of satellites already placed into orbit for the operator. Claro is a leading telecommunications company and Ombretel is part of it. Satellites will continue to be an important part of our infrastructure and business. We are part of the America Mobile Group a leader in the telecommunications market in Latin America. Star 1D2 was built by Maxar at the manufacturing facility in Palo Alto in the United States. The satellite will be launched into geostationary orbit 36,000 kilometers above our heads. Star 1D2 is an important project for Maxar because of our partnership with Embratel in the geostationary communications market. We have been working on this satellite here at Maxar since the fall of 2017. For over the past 36 years, Ombretel and Arian Bass have developed a strong and fruitful partnership. Since its creation in 1985, the Brazilian operator has entrusted the launch of all its satellites to Arian Bass. And Star 1D2 does not escape the rule. The CEO of Ombretel explains to our journalists why the company always chooses an Ariane launcher. We are working with the key international players to have the best combination of technology, cost and performance. Star 1D2 will improve access to high quality telecommunications and television services. It's intended to meet the needs of individual users, but also for businesses in South and Central America. The new satellite coverage will reach millions of people. The most important technological challenges that we had to overcome to build this satellite were the fact that there were many diverse payload bands to make this satellite operational. This hybrid satellite is composed of four different bands. The X band is for military use only. Star 1C band has exceptional power. Thanks to this, 
The satellite will be able to offer television coverage to more than 20 million satellite dishes in Brazil. The KU band will accompany the country's transition to 5G, a government requirement. With the KA band, Star 1D2 will significantly increase its mobile coverage capacity, particularly in the north of Brazil, which is one of the regions most affected by terrestrial connection problems. All of this will, of course, greatly benefit the population here. Each satellite beam will be able to connect 4,000 schools to the internet in the most remote areas. The development of the KA band in Brazil will also have an important impact on the agribusiness market. To reach remote areas is our aim to be the best option in all the market. With a great coverage of satellite, we will help transform businesses by bringing more possibilities for companies to reinvent themselves and to improve their service in addition to providing people with more ways to communicate and be entertained. Star 1D2, like the rest of the Star 1 fleet, will be controlled and monitored from the largest satellite control center in Brazil and Latin America, the Guaratiba Center. Created in 1983, it is located in the west side of Rio de Janeiro. But before taking off into space, the satellite had to go through another somewhat delicate journey. It's transport from Palo Alto to Kourou in one of the largest cargo aircrafts in the world. Star 1D2 is now ready for its ride into space. Before this satellite takes off and finds its place amongst the stars, let's welcome our space expert, Raphael Chevrier. Welcome, Raphael. Welcome. Hello. You are a business developer in charge of innovation at Arena Espace, and the question I want to ask you tonight is, today we can talk to whoever we want anywhere in the world, but what about tomorrow? What does tomorrow hold? Well, first of all, I'd like to um, remind that half of the population worldwide still lack of a reliable internet connection. And so satellites are really the perfect solution to come in addition to the terrestrial network and to provide connectivity to remote area where it's just too expensive to uh, put a cable there. I'm thinking of uh, archipelagos, deserts and mountain. And just to give you a recent example, we launched last year a Japanese satellite, BSAT-4B, who is right now providing TV broadcast in high definition um, for the Olympic Games that are happening right now. And I just wanted to remind that uh, yesterday we had um, an engineer at Ariane Group, Astrid Guillard, who won the silver medal in fencing, and I want to congratulate her. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, what, I, what I understand is that it can change things for me as an individual, but what will it change for companies? We can think of like very unlimited application there. Um, if you have like a strong connectivity, uh, you can apply it to moving targets like trains, boats, autonomous cars, um, planes, and etc. And there are strong implications in telemedicine also. With um, tomorrow, doctors being able to really take care of uh, a person's health remotely in real time and um, to assist, for example, a chirurgical uh, act uh, at distance. And also, all applications related to Internet of Things, um, so that tomorrow you can actually monitor your house uh, at distance, remotely, in real time, okay. anywhere. Well, thank yeah. you for all those information. You stay with us, because we are going to focus now on the second satellite that will be into orbit tonight. Yes, Baptiste, and this satellite is UTELSAT Quantum. It was developed by ESA with the operator UTELSAT and the satellite manufacturer Airbus. It is what you call a game-changing piece of technology. To, distund, sorry, to understand how innovative it is, let's watch this short report. It took place a few days ago on Toulouse's Airbus Defence and Space Facilities in France. It is here that the manufacturing teams were preparing to ship the satellite, Utelsat Quantum, before its long voyage to French Guyana. A rigorous operation in a sterilized room under controlled atmosphere. This 3.5-ton jewel of technology is the new benchmark in telecommunication satellites. Utelsat Quantum will be the first world uh, commercial uh, telecommunication satellite 
a fully reconfigurable in orbit. Standard geostationary satellites are configured during construction over fixed coverage. With this new generation of satellites, you will be able to modify the coverage and to pinpoint a specific area and to define a route to follow a plane or a shipping vessel. Utelsat Quantum is paving the way for a future generation of satellites and is a great example of international cooperation. As you can see, the final assembly is done here in our facilities in Airbus Event Space in Toulouse. You can see satellite behind me. And it's made of many components coming from Europe. The platform is coming from our subsidiaries, SSTL, for which we have uh, developed this product for the low range of our satellites. The fully flexible, innovative payload has been designed and built in Airbus Event Space in Portsmouth, where this payload has been totally innovated. So the development of Utelsat Quantum Active Antenna is a new technology that is developed in Spain and that is paving the way, positioning Airbus as a leader for flexible payload. What makes Utelsat Quantum so groundbreaking is its new multi-beam antenna. As we can see in this visual animation, its technological feat lies in its mobile aspect. One of the main challenges and the great achievement for Airbus is the groundbreaking multi-beam active receive antenna named ELSA+. Finally, our customers order a satellite with a specified mission unchanged throughout the whole lifetime of the satellite. In the case of Utelsat Quantum, our customer is able to reconfigure by software control in order to adapt to changing market conditions. Quantum is leading in the field for software different payloads on commercial spacecraft because it is the first to respond to a market demand for ultimate flexibility for customers. With this new standard and flexibility, Utelsat Quantum will provide communications on the move as required by aeronautical, maritime and land transportation. It will also provide a rapid response to civil protection, natural disaster response and security missions all using the latest encryption technologies. In a few minutes we'll be linking up to a Kourou for the launch of the Ariane 5 rocket but for the moment Raphael Chevrier, our space expert, is with us. Uh, Raphael, let's talk a little bit more about uh, Utelsat Quantum and in the report we just watched uh, we talk about a, a geostationary position, what it is. Yeah. Well, this is the position where the satellite is actually going. It's at uh, 36,000 kilometers from the Earth. It is a very convenient orbit for telecommunication satellites because the movement of the satellites there are synchronized with the rotation of the Earth. Okay. It means that they can actually provide um, the same um, applications all day long to the same region because they are facing the same region. So okay, they're turning with the, with the Earth at the same time. Exactly. Okay. So yeah, so 24 hours a day they can deliver services there. Okay, and uh, also we've heard about uh, the, 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 the fact that the, the satellite will be positioned, put, placed at 48 degrees east. Yeah. Same question, why? Well, because this location corresponds to the region uh, that the satellite wants to uh, actually 
um, deserve the, the application. So uh, in this case, it corresponds to a broad region from Europe to uh, the Middle East. And well, you, you've heard in the report that uh, Utelsat Quantum is actually like a real concentrate of technology because this is a reconfigurable satellite. It means that it is as flexible as operating several orbits, uh, several satellites in orbit at a time, and it can quickly adapt to the market change uh, geographically and in terms of uh, frequency bands. Okay. So yeah, it's a you. real game changer. Yeah, it, it is opening a new way of doing business in, in space. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much, Rafael. And for all you watching us live, just stay with us because we'll be heading back to Kourou in a couple of minutes. But just before, let's, let's watch what's coming next. Tonight on Road to Space, we are live from Guyana. a rocket. You want the answer? Stay aboard Road to Space and enjoy the ride. In less than 10 minutes, Ariane 5 will be lifting off from Kourou in French Guyana, but for the moment, let's welcome to the studio Mathieu Chez. Welcome, Good Mathieu. evening. Thank you. Hi. Mathieu, you've been working for Ariane Group for the last 18 years. You were part of the Ariane 6 development program, but we'll talk about that later. For the moment, we have a question for you and Raphael from our social, from our social networks, which should be coming up just behind me here. This one is from Daniel Fisher, a tweet. Do Ariane Space and ESA have a defined opinion about the precise <laughs> altitude where space begins? 100 kilometers or less or more? Well, this question probably refers to the recent debate uh, there was between two entrepreneurs that went to space. Um, Richard Branson, who went to 80 kilometers of altitude, which is recognized as the space limit by NASA, and Jeff Bezos, who went to 100 kilometers of altitude, which is recognized as space limit by the International Aeronautical uh, Federation. The reason for this debate is that the um, atmosphere is a continuous medium with no, like, real um, limit. Um, it's, you can travel um, hundreds of kilometers and you will still find particles like in space. Um, so uh, as a matter of fact, the, the, the atmosphere ends at uh, 950 kilometers from the Earth. We don't really have this debate at Ariane Space because we are launching satellites well above 100 kilometers uh, of altitude, several hundred kilometers of altitude. And so uh, we launched the satellites there and it requires a huge amount of energy, right? <laughs> yes, but uh, okay, maybe you do not care about that, but <laughs> when you're designing rockets, uh, this is really a, a huge matter because as you said, you're going through a continuous medium, you know exactly uh, how you need to model it very uh, precisely when you do simulations because even though at eight, uh, yeah, um, 80 or 100 kilometers you don't have that many particles, still you are going through this medium at a very, very high speed. We're talking about two kilometers per second and you know how many kilometers per, per hour it is, right? Yeah. Yeah, seven to eight uh, yeah, thousand like kilometers. Yeah, yeah, you did the conversion, <laughs> of course. So from there, all the particles you will heat will create some error flux and you need to be very aware of that in particular to, to determine the exact instant when you're going to separate the fairing because you don't want the, the satellites that are protected by it to be heard by these particles. Okay. So we well, have an end of question. Would this be of any operational importance for engineering, science or legal reasons? Uh, so for engineering, obviously, but uh, even for the International Space Station, this is an issue because at 400 kilometers of altitude, they're not that far, there are still particles, and they're actually decaying slowly because they're uh, they are hit by these uh, particles, so they need to be uh, reboosted from time to so time. Uh, regarding science, this is why in the... Video, attention pour la séquence finale lanceur. Uh -huh. Oh, sorry to interrupt you guys. Actually, we just heard uh, the DDO. Stop so I so it's seven minutes away from the launching. Amandine, can you explain us what is, uh, who is this guy and what, what is this announcement? 
Okay, so the DDO is the Wange uh, Operations Manager, and so tonight, uh, as I am, he will be connected uh, with the Telemetry Control Center. He will receive uh, all the information uh, so that we can follow what are the main milestones during this flight and that uh, we are on track regarding the launch. So now we enter the synchronized sequence, so that means that we are good to go. We will get the launch vehicle ready for liftoff. We will perform the isolation of the ground vehicle, uh, of the launch vehicle uh, from the ground. If we are going to go, that means that I don't remember, I rem yeah. if you remember, there was the, the panel behind you with all the greens. So that means that the space base is green. So space base uh, ensures uh, the means to track uh, the launch vehicle mm -hmm. and also uh, the safety, the security, uh, they monitor uh, the safe weather conditions. We have, of course, the, the launch vehicle. The and weather the launch is important? Weather is Even really launch important. Bracket? Yeah, it's really important. It's really important at, uh, at liftoff. I uh, ask you that because we can fly with planes on every weather. Yeah, so. uh, lightning are monitored because you don't want any kind of explosion at liftoff. And after that, you know, the trajectory is computed uh, following certain uh, conditions for the forecast. And uh, you don't want to have, for instance, uh, high, uh, high velocities uh, for the winds uh, because of, of the, that. Or otherwise, uh, you would have some risk uh, towards population. And so the last uh, green that you need, of course, is the one from uh, our customers. So now, this is the final autonomous sequence. Everything will be transferred to give autonomy to the launch vehicle. It will be isolated from the ground. We will uh, give the power to the launch vehicle. Uh, the launch vehicle will be the brain uh, of itself, and uh, it will uh, be ready for the liftoff with the last operation, the preparation of the ignition of the main stage. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt you because I have I have the, the, the clock over there. We are five minutes away from the liftoff. Let's go to Kuru and let's go to the Jupiter control room to see uh, what is happening over there. Hello, Cyril. Good to see you. You are our correspondent for Ariane Space tonight, and you are going to be reporting for us from behind the scene in this famous Jupiter control room. Well, my question is simple. What is that room? I guess it's what we see behind you. Uh, hello, Mattis, and welcome. Yes, uh, as you said, I am in the Jupiter Control Center, and more precisely, in what we call the fishbowl. Uh, this is the place where we receive all the information regarding the spaceport and the Ariane 5 status. But let me introduce the teams. So, just behind me, in the front row, and a little bit of the second one over there, we have the CNES launch specialists. They are in charge of coordinating and monitoring telemetry, weather data, um, telecommunication system uh, of the Space Force, and so many other things. Now, right here on the second row, we have the satellite operators and manufacturers. They are here to monitor their spacecraft, and afterwards, they will confirm the acquisition of the signal, which then means that the satellite is fine. Next to them, in the middle, we have the CNES and Orion Space Launch Managers. That is where Didio is sitting. He's the one who gets to say the final countdown we are all craving for. Next to him, we have uh, Orion Space... Uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, Mission Director, the conductor of the mission in charge of coordinating all the actors of the launch campaign. Now, all the way in the back, you have the authorities overseeing the launch. On the right, we have the one from the CNES, and on the left, the one from ESA. On the, from, sorry, on the right, we have the one from ESA, and on the left, the one from the CNES. Now, let me take you to a very special place. I am Spaces Den. So, this is where we have the area dedicated to the Orion Space Project Managers and the Satellite Program Directors. They are here to make sure that everything is going smoothly. Now let's get to our final stop. Well, actually, you've already been here earlier today with Stefan. 
who is now sitting right there. So this area is where our top management is overseeing the entire lounge. And on the other side of this uh, glass wall, you can see that tonight we have an audience. They are from uh, the clients teams and from uh, the spaceport uh, and we also have a few outside guests. As you can see, they are opening the door to actually let the public outside in order for them to actually be able to watch the show live from the, the terraces. Well, thank you very much, Cyril, and uh, we let those people concentrate because uh, we are one minute and 28 seconds away from uh, the launching, so, so from the liftoff. So now we're going to watch the show because this is what we are here to enjoy the show. And <laughs> Yes, Cross fingers. that's not exactly how we call it as engineers. Attention. Yes. <laughs> so it's one, one minute away from the launching. We hear the DDO. This is the DDO speaking, announcing different steps. Excited. And we will have the countdown within a few seconds. We are 45, 45 seconds from the liftoff. 40 seconds away, wow. And I guess everybody over there is concentrated. Yeah, and look at Amandine. Amandine yes. <laughs> sitting next to me. <laughs> it's really I live that so many times. You don't know all the things that can happen. So I'm really focused. <laughs> It's difficult for her because she has information on one side. Yeah, we know. Us talking to her. 15 seconds away. To the DDO, attention for the decamp final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, stop. Allumage Vulcan. So impressive. Oh, met a bord nomino. Well, we have just seen Ariane 5 disappear towards space. Do stay with us, everyone, because what's nominal. going to happen next is as crucial as the next launch. This is, of course, the moment when the two satellites, Star 1D2 and Utilsat Quantum, separate from the launcher and are placed into orbit. But that's not all, is it, Baptiste? Uh, yeah, I guess it's not all. I was really uh, watching at those impressive, uh, impressive images. And uh, to answer images. your question, I'm going to uh, uh, ask uh, Amandine. So, Amandine, uh, how many kilometers does uh, Ariane 5 travel before nominal. the launching of the satellites? So, in fact, uh, Ariane 5 is not going to go to the GO orbit, uh, this orbit of interest. Uh, that would be quite a journey. So, we are going to the GTO orbit, so the geo transfer orbit, uh, which is uh, an ellipse around the Earth, uh, which uh, lowest point uh, is close to the Earth. And so this is where the upper stage is going to get us. We will reach roughly an altitude of uh, 650 kilometers. And this orbit has an interest. The highest point is located at the same radius of the GEO orbit. And so that will be up to the customers once they are released into the GTO orbit to get to the GTO orbit and to do the final maneuvers to circularize the orbit and be in the GEO orbit. I guess and I hope everything is uh, calculated and programmed. So what is the role of the team in COOL right now? So everything is pre-programmed on board, but you remember I talked about the onboard computers, so the launch vehicles knows exactly where it is, where it is located, what is its acceleration and velocity, yeah. and so it will reach the orbit by recomputing the orbit every time in order to get the maximum performance and the best accuracy. Right now, the main active people in Kourou, you don't see them, they are in the ground. We did have an important event. I have the confirmation that we have the EAP separation. It's the booster separation. Yeah, the booster separations. 
Yeah, booster have been separated. So that's at 2 minutes 20 is the time when the two boosters leave the rocket. Why is it specifically 2 minutes 20? Could it be earlier or later? Yes, it can, because I was talking Operation about nominal, the about trajectory. Nominal. And so you trigger the separation of the boosters when you do no longer need them. So that means that they have done the job in showing most of the, 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 the power that you need uh, to escape from, uh, from ground. Mm -hmm. And so by recomputing the trajectory, there is a point at which you know that they do no longer push because the acceleration is low. And so the onboard computer is going to trigger uh, the separation of the boosters. Okay. And so it roughly, usually it happens within a, a few seconds in comparison to the prediction. And now we will be witnessing the next step, I guess, I hope. I did have the confirmation, so now it's the separation of the fairing. So the fairing uh, was there to protect the satellites uh -huh. from the acoustic in ground because the liftoff uh, creates a lot of noise and from the atmosphere, as, as it was mentioned uh, by Mathieu and uh, Raphael. And so we separate the fairing, same, the onboard, the onboard computer, we compute everything, knowing exactly what is the velocity, what is the altitude, it can recompute the flux, and when we are under the threshold, the maximum uh, flux that we authorize for the launch vehicle and for our customers, the onboard computer triggers the separation of the fairing. Okay, I guess now more or less uh, RN5 is uh, out of sight. Uh, how will we keep the link? How will Kuru keep the link with the rocket? We will keep uh, the link uh, with the rocket uh, thanks to a network of one station, uh, which are in uh, visibility with the launch vehicle. They receive what we call the telemetry of the launch vehicle. Telemetry are the key flight measurements uh, from the launch vehicle. And you have a team in crew, you were asking me the questions, mm -hmm. which is located in, uh, in the first station, the one in, uh, in Galio. And they will receive all the telemetry of the launch vehicle. They will process it, analyze it, and make sure that it, it is coherent uh, with uh, what was the forecast. And they yeah. will give us and give me and give the DDO tonight uh, all the, the main milestones. Okay, so and they are analyzing the data. Exactly. Okay. And after that, the launch vehicle will be tracked by uh, another uh, uh, network of stations. So it will be followed by Natal in Brazil. In the Atlantic Ocean, we will have Ascension. We'll talk about that later because Libre I Libre think we will Kenya. follow every step. Yeah, we will. We understand that the launcher is in full flight now. So what is its speed? What is its altitude? How fast is it going at the moment? So right now we are at an altitude of uh, roughly uh, 160 kilometers and the speed is above uh, 3 kilometers per second. And okay. so what to explain the audience, you have all the, the numbers, yeah, all the data in front of you. We do have the data. And so what is uh, worth uh, mentioning is that uh, now the mass is uh, only of uh, 160 tons. And before it was what, 775 tons? Yeah, so enormous. reason which for which we separate uh, these boosters because uh, simple wool in space, the lighter the better if you want to get faster. Lighter, higher, faster. <laughs> okay, I understand. Um, <laughs> next we think of a song. Oh. Punk song. Yeah, but that's it's same for me. Side, side, uh, side subject. Uh, Mathieu, uh, let me ask you a question. When we were preparing this show and uh, we were talking about the VA254. Yes. So what is it? A code? Secret code? It, it's indeed a secret code. I cannot communicate on this, Baptiste. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, it's uh, the numbering of the flight we're considering for V for vol. A for Ion, obviously, so Ion flight, uh, 254. But uh, what's interesting is that this counter started uh, 41 years ago with the first flight of Ion, which was Ion 1 in 1979. On the 24th of December. On December, yeah. yeah, because ah. we launched on Christmas Eve <laughs> when yeah, necessary. That was, uh, the birth of Ion was on uh, Christmas yeah. Eve. Very nice. So for uh, Christmas time, you watch uh, the launching of the rockets. No. So it's I, kind of a good present. Yeah, but I was not born. <laughs> I'm a bit surprised. No, I was born uh, a month later. <laughs> <laughs> so now we are following uh, the next steps and uh, we are about seven minutes after the launching. And, uh, and now you were talking about the, the, the bases on the, on the ground, on Earth, which uh, are linked to the, to, the, to the rocket. So now who are we linked to? Where are we linked to? We will probably approach Natal. Uh, we will uh, approach the visibility of uh, Natal, yes, indeed. And so it's, that means that uh, we are along the path, uh, away from, the, from the, the American coast. Okay, so what is Natal? 
Natal is a grand uh, tracking station uh, in Brazil. In Brazil, yeah. Yes. And so now we're waiting the DDO announcement that would uh, specify that uh, Natal uh, is linked to the rocket. Yes. <laughs> I did not any news. And so no. what because it's a cryogenic engine and it's not a given for, it's always uh, an intense moment because uh, cryogenic uh, uh, ignition in the space conditions. So now we enter the second propel phase uh, with uh, the upper stage uh, that will get our customers to the final orbit, the GTO orbit. Okay, well, thank you very much, Amandine. We keep on focusing on all those uh, important formations. Thank you, Amandine. Thank you so much for all that. Well, we are now less than 20 minutes away from the separation of the first satellite and of course we'll be going live from the Jupiter control room in Kourou. But for the moment, let's now focus on today's passengers. Two telecommunication satellites. How do they work? Well, the answer is in this short report, guys. To understand how a communication satellite works, you'll need to get the bigger picture. A satellite is made up of two parts. The service module, or bus, is the part that contains the equipment necessary for its operation. The other part is the communication module, called the payload. This is where the antennas and electronic equipment are located. Information is sent from a ground station, which then transmits this information to a satellite in the form of high-frequency signals. These signals arrive in the transponder, which receives and transmits the signal. They are then sent back to one or more other ground stations and relayed by antennas or cables to the end user. Looking up at the sky, we could notice that some satellites remain fixed and others move quickly. This is because they are not located in the same orbits. A satellite that remains fixed is in the geo orbit for geostationary. At about 36,000 kilometers in height, at the equator level, it revolves with the Earth. This is why it seems to be fixed in the sky while it is moving at three kilometers per second. At this altitude, the satellite constantly covers a very large geographical area that never changes. To serve specific applications, geosatellites will need a hand. Some of them need a latency that is extremely low. Latency is the time needed for the signals to reach the satellite and return back on Earth. Less than 500 milliseconds on the one hand, less than 50 for low Earth orbit, LEO satellites. But as they are lower, between 400 and 2,000 kilometers of altitude, they move faster and cover a limited geographic area for a short time. They are then operated in constellations. Well, uh, Raphael, watching this report, we understood that uh, the future of satellites is in a way in constellation. And we've been talking before the show, and I was talking to you about uh, Jeff Bezos and, um, and, and, uh, and Elon Musk. Uh, Elon, no, no, Musk Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. I heard they plan to send more than 45,000 satellites. Mm -hmm. My question is, is there enough room over there? Well, just look at the sky and you can see that it's vast enough to host like many, many planes, for example. And space, it's much better because the more distant from the Earth, the more space and volume you have to, fill, to be filled with satellites. 
Um, it's not an issue in geostationary orbit because it's very far from the Earth. In LEO orbits... The acquisition of the measure by the station of Natal. In yeah. low Earth orbit... Sorry, to, sorry yeah. to interrupt you, uh, Amandine. What does it mean, Natal? Yeah, Natal, so that means that uh, we have uh, the acquisition... The nominal, attendu. Yeah, it was, it was uh, as it was planned, so we had the acquisition... Okay, so yes, there, is a, there will be a, a, a gap of visibility, but that's completely planned, that's normal. Okay. And so during this phase, which is a quick one, uh, all the data will be recorded on board. Okay. And so they will be transferred uh, down uh, to the next one station. Uh, Acquisition de la télémesure par la station d'ascension. So ascensions will recover uh, what, whatever has been downloaded and it will yeah. be analyzed by the, the team crew. Well, okay, everything is perfect. I'm sorry, uh, we can go back to that question. Is there enough room over there? Yeah, I, I was saying that the uh, low Earth orbit is more like conditions and I, I think that the, the main issue is to really set common rules in order to regulate the traffic, like we do it in, on the road and on the seas and in, in the air, of course. And um, the main ch challenge um, is to do it in a sustainable way. And um, yeah, in order to really avoid the satellites to uh, collide with each other, that would generate uh, many debris. And of course, that's not good in order to uh, continue to do activities in space. Okay. And uh, just one quick question. Uh, I feel I have everything I need with my phone. What satellites and constellation can give me more? This is because you live in Paris, a big city. <laughs> uh, so yeah, no, I mean, uh, satellites are like a very good, even in big cities actually, satellites are good solutions to uh, bring re re resilience to terrestrial uh, networks. But it's also a matter of sovereignty uh, for states. And this is why the European Commission is working on its own uh, constellations of satellites in order to bring internet connectivity to European citizens. Okay, well, thank you very much, Raphael. In less than 15 minutes, we'll go back to uh, Operation Room in Kourou to watch the next stage of the mission. That will be the separation of the first satellites from Ions 5. But before this, let's now focus on something which we are all eager to hear more about. Of course, I'm referring to Ariane 6. Ariane's group, Next Generation Launcher. Let's look at this report and we'll talk about it afterwards, so sit back and enjoy. Four kilometers from Ariane 5's launch pad, the future is well underway. Here at Ariane 6's launch zone, it's been a hive of activity with its new impressive mobile gantry built on the launch pad and Ariane 6's assembly building. Work was carried out on 170 hectares of land surrounded by a tropical jungle, which now hosts the launch complex Ella 4. Thierry Vallée is the site manager for Kness. We are now actually between the bâtiment d'assemblage lanceur and the zone de lancement on the route qui relie donc les deux installations. A giant mobile gantry has been built. It is 90 meters high and 50 meters wide and weighs in at 8,000 tons. It is heavier than the Eiffel Tower. The inside of this structure will be used to protect the workers in case of bad weather while they assemble the launcher. Le portique d'Ariane 6 a cette particularité d'être mobile parce qu'il a besoin de pouvoir être déplacé de 140 mètres vers, vers le nord pour dégager le lanceur quelques heures avant le décollage. The infrastructure is already well underway and since April tests have been carried out in the spaceport as you can see from these impressive images. Around the launch table, 60 valves must open in less than a second to let 30,000 liters of water gush through per second. The launcher emits des gaz chauds à plus de 3000 degrés and generates des vibrations à 180 decibels, donc c'est à peu près 1 million de fois le bruit d'un marteau piqueur. Et donc on imagine bien qu'il faut protéger les, les installations de toutes ces agressions du, lors du décollage. 900 mètres cubes d'eau qui sont nécessaires au déluge viennent d'un château d'eau qui conserve donc cette eau à plus de 80 mètres de haut. After the launch, the water is pumped and sent to a water treatment plant. Tous les paramètres naturels de l'eau vont être vérifiés et contrôlés et au bout de deux semaines environ, donc l'eau pourra de nouveau être relâchée dans le milieu naturel. In the meantime, the launcher is also getting itself ready. Ariane 6 has just passed its biggest technical challenge to date, the engine tests, which were all successfully completed. 
tous nos systèmes propulsifs ont terminé leurs essais de qualification et on a maintenant devant nous la démonstration que ces systèmes propulsifs fonctionnent dans leur environnement du système lanceur général. Ce sont les essais à feu à Lampolshausen et en Guyane. Et les deux grosses innovations, c'est sur les, les boosters à poudre avec une enveloppe composite et l'APU, ce système qui euh, est unique au monde et on l'a inventé dans le courant du développement. At the foot of the rocket, the P120C boosters, which also equip the Vega C launcher, can be integrated with either two or four boosters on Ariane 6. They provide thrust during the first 135 seconds of flight and ensure escape from the Earth's atmosphere. The second engine, the super powerful Vulcane 2.1, is the main stage engine and provides a thrust of 140 metric tons. Then comes the Turner Vinci, the upper stage engine. It's reignited and enables improved precision on all types of missions and towards all orbits. The fourth motorized system, the auxiliary power unit, is the rocket's major asset. It enables payloads to be deployed into several orbits. This is crucial for satellite constellations. Pour le lanceur lui-même, on a défini l'architecture du lanceur. On s'apprête à déposer la définition que l'on va qualifier pour aller en vol. Et à côté de ça, on a commencé à produire les, et les étages. Qui se un premier étage de Libreville supérieur et sur son banc d'essai à Lampolshausen pour réaliser des essais à feu dans les semaines qui viennent. Et on réalise également le lanceur qui va partir en Guyane en septembre pour réaliser les essais combinés du sol et du bord. In Kourou, the European Space Agency, which funds and manages the entire Ariane 6 program, supervises the work carried out by Kness and Ariane Group. Ici, nous nous trouvons devant le, le BAL, le bâtiment d'assemblage lanceur d'Ariane 6. The agency is the architect of the project and is the main link between Europe and Guyana. Dans ce bâtiment, nous intégrerons à l'horizontale, contrairement à ce qu'on faisait sur Ariane 5, les deux étages, cœur central d'Ariane 6. For the moment, this is just a mock-up at the launch pad. Once the technical qualifications of the rocket elements are completed, Europe's spaceport will start its combined tests. Pour ces essais combinés, nous aurons les premiers éléments maquettes, mais des vrais éléments lanceurs qui viendront des Mureaux, de Bram, etc. ici en Guyane, s'interfacer avec les éléments du sol développés par le CNES. L'objectif, à la fin de ces essais combinés, c'est l'autorisation de la première campagne de lancement Ariane 6. In Ariane 6 schedule, this is the last step before its inaugural flight. Welcome to the living room, Road to Space is living room. Raphael and Mathieu. Mathieu says you have been working for the Ariane Group and you are more specifically working for Ariane 6's development program since day one. Ariane 6 has made and launched its program for next year. Can you tell us a bit about what technical changes have been made to this Ariane as opposed to Ariane 5? Well, I'm very happy about this report because you could really get an overview of everything that's, that's new and uh, you could see the facilities we have and the new means and with, and with this means we'll be able to, to operate, manufacture, assemble uh, the launch in a, in a cheaper and a very efficient way. This is a really a big change. Also, the fact that you could play with a number of boosters, uh, either with two or four boosters, means that uh, with RN6, you actually have two launchers for the price of one. And uh, finally, the big game changer to me is uh, the upper stage. The upper stage, uh, cryotechnic upper stage with Vinci and APU engines uh, that we can reignite in orbit. And from there, uh, it opens many perspectives in terms of missions. Yeah, you, you, I agree with you. We can do like many many type of missions to any orbit um, it's also important because you can actually do right chair mission you can accommodate as many satellites the moon <laughs> as a matter of fact we are preparing the first european mission to the moon with Ariane 6 it's going to happen during this decade and we are also preparing a mission to mars it's going to happen in 2026 with Ariane 6 we will bring we will send a space probe to mars we will catch the mars samples um, that was collected by Perseverance, and we will bring back to Earth in 2031. Uh, so this is very, very exciting perspectives. Thank you so much, you two. We're now going to go back to Baptiste, who is with the representative from the European Space Agency. It's back to you, Baptiste. Yeah, thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you, Emma. Good, good evening, uh, Daniel Neuswander. Welcome to Road to Space. You've worked all your career in space industry, and you are today the Space Agency's Director of Space Transportation. 
Uh, in the last report we saw, the next tech report, we, we saw that RN6 is now turning into reality. Can you tell us what was ESA's role in the development of the launcher? Yes, good evening to all of you. And uh, ESA's role in the development of RN6 had basically two main functions. Number one, we were the development procuring entity. And second, we were the launch system architect, as you just said it in the film. Uh, this means that we define the high-level requirements, we adapt the institutional uh, needs for the future of this uh, launcher, and we accept the deliverables. The deliverables which is a rocket on the one side, provided under prime ship of Iron Group, and on the other side of the launch base, uh, provided by We bring it together at the occasion of the combined test, where we uh, manage them through the definition of this combined test, where it has to have a perfect synchronization of these two elements, and we uh, verify that this happens before we go to liftoff. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. Next to you, we have uh, Marie-Anne Claire, the director of the Guyana Space Center. Marie-Anne Claire, do you hear me? Yeah, nice to see you. Uh, yes, good evening. We saw also in the report those uh, new buildings have been built for the upcoming launcher. How many people were involved in such a huge work and huge construction? We, we started the construction for the new launcher IN6 in uh, uh, 2019, so uh, it is uh, 3,000 people which are working on the base to adapt uh, it, but not at full time, and we have a peak in 2018 with uh, 600 people. And today we are around 200 people which are working still on the ELA4 in order to start and to prepare the combined test as explained by uh, Daniel before. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you very much, uh, Marianne Claire. We'll uh, come back to Kou a little bit later. Now we go back to a uh, live sequence because uh, we are approaching uh, a critical or important uh, sequence, uh, Amandine. Uh, in some a couple of seconds, the DDO would normally confirm the switching of the engine of the, on the upper floor. This is the information you're waiting for. Yes, we are waiting uh, for the shutdown of the upper stage engine. So that means that uh, we would have uh, reached the final uh, injection orbit, the GTU orbit. So it's a critical and really important moment. It's an important moment. So that means that uh, we have uh, finished uh, the, the, the propelled phase. What happened in Okay, so we had the confirmation that, uh, yeah, yeah, so the, the upper engine has been cut off, and so now we are in orbit. Okay. Okay. Wow. So, as we, so, so as we say, uh, so far, so good. Thank so you very far, much, so Amandine. In a minute, we'll be uh, focusing on our uh, social networks and answering your question. Just before, let's have a look at what's coming next. Tonight, in Road to Space, we've just witnessed the launch of Ariane 5 and two telecommunications satellites. Shortly, we'll be answering all your questions from social networks and taking a look at the science fiction film, Stow Away. We will ask our experts, is it really possible for an intruder to get aboard a rocket? How long was I out? Please, I gotta go back. We're not going back. What do you mean we're not going back? This is a two-year mission. Fact or fiction, stay with us for the next part of Road to Space. Raphael and Mathieu, well, we're back and we have another question for both of you from our social networks. As you know, our time is limited because in less than four minutes we'll be going back to Kourou where all the team is waiting for the next step of the mission, the first separation. But I've got another little tweet from Arthur du Abmir who's asking us about the Kessler syndrome. Now, what is the Kessler syndrome? The well, this is a theoretical scenario according to which um, the number of space debris um, in low Earth orbit reach a point where it creates like a chain reaction um, leading to so many debris in orbit that we would actually not be able to use space anymore. But thankfully, uh, in Europe, we have a French space law which is ruling the way that we are performing the, uh, our launch missions. Uh, in a way that uh, we uh, are observing the best practice in order to really 
make launch services in the most uh, sustainable approach. Yes, um, indeed. So I just told you about the fact that uh, you, can, you can reignite the upper stage of RN6. Mm -hmm. We'll be able to do that, which means that at the end of the mission, once you've deployed the, the satellites, you'll be, you'll be able to reignite the Vinci engine or the APU uh, to perform a deorbitation, which means that you remove the upper stage from its orbit. So it means basically that at the end of the mission, we clean behind us. Yeah, the, the, the Kessler syndrome, the, the, the Kessler effect you're talking about reminds me of uh, the first sequence we had in the, the, the movie Gravity. Is it the same this thing? is exactly uh, the type of um, catastrophic event. Oh, <laughs> you're pretty more studying that. movies than. Uh, we, we are not there yet. Uh, <laughs> th th thanks to Thomas Pesquet. Well, thank you very much. We are, uh, thank you both for all this information. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, more questions for you, and we will try to answer uh, all of them by the end of the program. But now it's time for us to focus on Embratel satellite Star 1 G2, which is just about to separate from Ariane 5. So we're waiting for this uh, moment. Should, and Amandine, you will tell us? Yeah, I will tell you. For the moment, we are doing all, all the maneuvers necessary before the separation of uh, the satellite. Uh, it's what we call the, the space ballet. So you want to get to the right attitude, the one desired by the customers, the right spin. And I did have the confirmation of Star 1D2. Star 1D2. Well, so far so good. Let's go back right now to Kourou, uh, where normally Cyril should be linked with us. Uh, Cyril, are you waiting? Are you? Do you hear us, Cyril? Well, we can see all the faces in the in the Jupiter room. Everybody is really concentrated. Ah, Cyril, it's good to see you. What's 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 the yes? Welcome there? back, Betis. Well, actually, as you can see, uh, still tensed. We just got the confirmation of the separation for Star 1D2, but let's remember that we still have a second passenger on board, and the mission is not over just yet. So that's why you see that people are still working, concentrated, and we are waiting for the next updates. Well, thank you very much. So we, we could say that half of the job is done, mm. main part of it but we still have a big issue. Uh, and this issue, Amandine, we, uh, we are going to talk about uh, the, this first separation um, with you, Rafael. But just before, Amandine, can you tell us more about SILDA? Okay, the SILDA is uh, the black cone that you can see on uh, the animation. Uh, so that's uh, what we call uh, the dual uh, launch structure, and that allows us to perform the dual launch configuration. And in fact, what you want to do is to make the most of all the performance available. Uh, I did have the confirmation of the separation of the SILDA. SILDA. So the SILDA is uh, the structure that allows you to embark two satellites that want to go to the same direction. Okay. And in fact, if we want to talk about innovation, that's somehow a precursor of uh, the next white share mission. And now we will perform the next maneuvers in order to get to the right attitude and orientation for a telsat quantum. Thank you, Amandine. Now, if I can come back to you, Raphael, and talk about the first separation that just happened. For the operator, Ombretel, this must be such a relief for all the teams over there. They were under such a lot of pressure. What do you think? Yeah, of course. I mean, like uh, Cyril and Amandine said, Ariane is actually uh, designed to do dual launch, so we are separating two satellites in orbit. But he said that uh, we half of the job uh, was done. Actually, we have three separations. The first satellite, the SILDA, yeah. and the upper, um, the lower uh, satellite. Uh, it means that I, I can let you imagine if the SILDA is not rightly uh, separated, you, you can't, you what's can't. going to happen when we we'll try to separate the, the, yeah. the last satellite. So of course, everybody is still focused on the, on the rest of the mission. Yeah, actually, yeah, we were focusing on the satellites, but yeah, there's the SILDA is I mean, if, if, you, if it's still there, I guess you can't free, you can't separate from the second satellite. You have some problems, yes. Okay. I can well, before we focus on the separation of uh, the UTELSAT, uh, the UTELSAT Quantum, the second satellite, we are going to take you on a journey, on a voyage. Uh, we are going to watch the trailer of a science fiction film named Stowaway, and then we are going to try to answer a question could a passager clandestin, an intruder, an illegal intruder, get into a rocket? Let's watch the trailer of the movie. Bunnett. The 
commander of the ship. Do you remember what happened on the pad? I'm a launch support engineer, ma'am. How long was I out? We took off about 12 hours ago. 12 hours? I need to get back to my no. sister, please. My sister, she's alone. Please, I've got to get back. We're not going back. What do you mean we're not going back? This is a two-year mission. Two years is a long time to be away, but this is the opportunity of a lifetime. That was, well, welcome you both back to the fact-checking segment from Road to the Space Living Room. I have with me, um, I'm just going through the trailer, and for all of those of you who haven't seen it or haven't seen the film, maybe I should put you back in the picture of the summary. It's the story of a three-person crew on a two-year mission to Mars and the dilemma they face when an unplanned fourth passenger suddenly arrives on board, what we call the stowaway. So my first question, obviously, to you both is, is this a plausible scenario? I really hope not. <laughs> now, if, if it happens, I really would really, um, advise the launch service provider to uh, rethink its processes because it's all about processes, right? Yeah, if you think about uh, when we manufacture the launcher, everything is checked because what, one of the risks that we fear is what we call uh, foreign object damage, okay? So that we have a, you forgot a screwdriver, a tool, anything, and it damages uh, the rocket during the launch. So everything's monitored. Yeah, and every, every tool is labeled, and uh, you have a specific team who is taking care of uh, making sure that uh, nothing is left uh, inside the yeah. launch vehicle. So everything inside, okay, but what about outside? I mean, we are in Karoo, for God's sake. Mm. It's a tropical jungle out there. <laughs> what about mosquitoes flying around? What about animals? <laughs> okay, yeah, I can confirm. Karoo is wild. Uh, yeah, when you're, you're there, when you're uh, dealing with a huge integration holes, uh, what you fear is that uh, some birds, for instance, get inside the buildings. This is why we had to hire also an animal specialist, specialist oh. in animal's behavior, uh, who is in charge of when we open the door to place traps, uh, to actually make diversions with uh, flashlights, etc., in order to prevent animals to yeah. come in. What about dust particles getting into the top of the satellite? Yeah, even a speck of dust is an issue for us. So that's why uh, the, the air is filtered around the, the satellites and, yeah. and clearly monitored. Yeah, and for scientific payloads, it's even worse, like the James Webb Space Telescope that we will be uh, we will launch uh, at the end of this year. I think we have some images here of the yeah. Cumulus curtain. Um, you know, a, a speck of dust is like, would really like damage ah, the mission and uh, make uh, this telescope blind. You see that here they are using UV lamp in order to. Really really detect the dirt there. If, for example, if you're proud of um, the cleanliness of your bathroom, just uh, light it up with a UV lamp. That's right. And pro I promise that you will never want to shower again there. Why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Well, now I know I'm reassured that there is no way an intruder can get into an Ariane 5 rocket. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're going to go over now to Kourou and go over to um, Baptiste, who will be talking about the separation of the Utelsat quantum. Let's go over to him now. Yes, Emma, in less than uh, 10 seconds, you, uh, well, yeah, more or less 10 seconds, Utelsat quantum uh, satellite should be released from Ariane 5 launcher. So that's really a crucial point. We're waiting and we should see the people happy and clapping if everything is turning good, and that should be on the yes. predicted time, 10 seconds so away. We had the acquisition of the white attitude. Okay. So here it's quiet, but lots of things happening over there. We had this, yes, we had the separation of the Delta so that's the end of the. The mission for, for the launch vehicle. Okay, so uh, we hear people clapping. I see your face. I see your face, Raphael, uh, and Mathieu also. So I guess this is, in a way, the end of the mission. Let's go back uh, immediately to uh, Kourou to see uh, the atmosphere over there. Yeah, you can see the team Check. cheering up, clapping. Check and now uh, we should be linked uh, with uh, Stefan Israel. Stefan Israel, are, are, are you there? <laughs> I remember Stefan Israel, yes, the CEO. Sure. I'm here with you. Okay, yeah. You still have your mask, but I, I, I can I can figure out a, a huge smile. Yeah. Whoa, yeah. Nice. So you're happy. <laughs> good news. And good yes, customers. I'm very happy, happy but I am happy for my customers. Yes, for sure. You've been no, it's very important for our customers. Uh, uh, Well, 
uh, it's okay. This is why we are launching satellite because we have a little so, yeah. delay between yes, uh, Stefan and me. And uh, well, you were talking about your happy customers. I guess it's really important for you. Yes, it's very important for uh, Ariane Space because it was the first uh, Ariane 5 uh, of the year and uh, it had to be a success and tonight it's a great success. It's very important for us to pay the tribute to all the contributors of this success. We have uh, our prime Ariane group. We have here with us uh, CNES, which is our daily partner in CSG. We have ESA. It is a success of uh, the whole European team, for sure, Ariane Space as well. And for our customers, Brazilian customers, Ambratel, French customer, UTELSAT, very innovative satellite, Maxar, American manufacturer, Airbus Defense and Space, European manufacturer. Tonight, it's a victory for all of them, and I really want to thank them for their trust to Ariane Space. And it's, it's a great start for what you call the Ariane season, because it's just the first <laughs> launching. Yes, it is the first of the Ariane season, and you know that now we have two very important Ariane 5 uh, w which are about to be launched. One will be for SES and uh, French DGA, and the other one for, for James Webb Telescope. It will be the climax of the year. And we have also, during this summer, a very busy summer, we will have Vega uh, for Playa Neo for Airbus on the August 16th, and then a Soyuz from Baikonur on August the 19th for one web so it is also the beginning of a busy summer for all our teams well thank you very much good luck for a huge uh, job you have uh, during the summer uh, and we'll be watching definitely we'll be watching the next launching thank you very much Stefan Meanwhile, let's take a moment to answer one last time the question sent by our audience, and it sure is a headline topic we've kept for you. Let's take a look with our first tweet from Astro Hayden, who I believe is a, is a boy, is a guy. Greetings, Arian Space. I'm very excited for the future with advancement of technology capabilities. How far are we away to one day launching humans on an Arian rocket? Yeah, that, that's a question for Arian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I can confirm it's a boy, actually. Uh, we, we know well. It's Astro a boy. Yeah, during lockdown, he, he made very good uh, use of his time because with his parents he built uh, an iron 6 model which is a uh, very very nice so, so he, he's probably one he will be maybe sitting on your on your chair uh, on your chair yeah and, and maybe he'll build uh, <laughs> rockets that bring uh, human to space yeah. <laughs> and I'll tell you why because I think we have all as uh, techno bricks to go to space what do you need you need to, to have a reliable launcher with high performance that's what you'll get with iron 6 because we'll be able to launch uh, more than four astronauts to, to space with the performance we'll get uh, you need to be able to re-enter from space this is something that has been demonstrated uh, with the IXV program. It will be done with the Space Rider, something that we master. And then the final brick would be, uh, can you do a, a capsule? Can you do a spaceship that goes to space? We did that uh, five times, launched by Iron 5 with the automated transfer vehicle. Uh, but we are still doing things on, on that topic with Orion, for instance. Yeah, we can mention that ESA is uh, implied in the uh, Orion module, which will bring human back to the moon, actually. Whoa. Yeah, so I, I actually really agree with you, Mathieu, <laughs> that uh, you Europe has everything needed to do this. Uh, the experience, the technology, and the motivation also. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And as a matter of fact, also in a more commercial perspective, um, this, is, this market is getting stronger and stronger. Today, uh, with astronauts going more often into the, the ISS, that is where uh, our European hero, Thomas Pesquet, yeah. is actually uh, He's running some watching, experiments. Watching our live now. I hope, I so hope he is watching us, yes. <laughs> Hello, Thomas. And, um, and tomorrow, um, many more astronauts going to the moon. And so, yes, just... Let me ask you a stupid question. Why should we go, human go back on the moon? Ah, for many, many reasons. First of all, because I was not born when it happened. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I need to do this live. <laughs> and um, the, the moon is also very uh, scientific, um, a lot of scientific uh, interest. Because um, we went there, but um, we didn't, uh, we went to uh, very few locations on the moon, and we brought back samples that are, are very limited, and the moon can really um, um, bring us knowledge on how the Earth was formed. But also, the moon has resources on the surface. You can, for example, transform the regolith, which is the, the, the dust that is covering the surface of the moon, into water or oxygen. So it really gives you the conditions to. Uh, uh, really dream of a sustainable presence of a human on the moon. And you can also dream of 
um, transforming it into fuel in order to fuel rockets wow. that would lift off from the moon and go deeper in space, for example, Mars, but even deeper than that. So lots of very exciting perspectives on the moon. That's a dreamer. Yeah. That's a dream. We had another question on social yeah, media. Um, we had one from Roman Batman, he's called. Is the Aaron Sang officially him. certified to fly humans? Yeah, yeah. I think it refers to the fact that uh, RN5 was also initially thought uh, to, to be flying Hermes, which was the European uh, space uh, uh, spaceship somehow program, but uh, it didn't happen. But uh, there's a good point about this, is that uh, the re high reliability you have with RN5 is actually uh, in the DNA of the rocket because of this ambition. So it has not been, uh, it has not been certified per se for human spaceflight, but uh, still we, we somehow inherit from it. Okay, can we have, uh, can we dream big and uh, imagine, for example, a space uh, station like uh, the ISS around the moon? This is, this is yeah. not a dream. It's actually <laughs> happening. Yeah. Like you know, you know, the, the ISS, the International Space Station, is going to come to an end, and the states that are investing in the ISS are thinking and building right now uh, Lunar Gateway, which is like an international space station around the moon, uh, in order to make this sustainable presence of a human astronauts uh, around the moon a reality. And Europe is actively participating to this, uh, to some module of these of this, uh, space stations. So yes, you yeah, need yeah. to be, to, to, to dream bigger. Uh, much yeah, bigger. But right? you you bigger. Dream, well, yeah. but we'll have a lot of topics to discuss on the next shows. Because it's <laughs> oh, really it's interesting. That's a key. That's a, that's a question that is, uh, you know, interesting to everybody. Yeah. Thank you very much, both of you, for all this uh, information. And uh, we are now going back to Kourou uh, to see how the teams are going and to meet some uh, really happy customers, I guess. Hello, Cyril. Uh, it looks you've changed place. Yes, actually, I'm a little closer to the main screen we have in the fishbowl. Well, okay, so uh, so close to the main st uh, to the main stage. Well, uh, Cyril, uh, it looks like it is time uh, for us to meet our next special guest. We have uh, Pascal Omzi, CTO of Utelsat, Elodie Vio, uh, Director of Telecommunications and Integrated Applications at ESA, and we have also uh, Christophe Dallest, Utelsat Quantum Program Manager at Airbus Defence and Space. It's hard to say. Uh, can you ask them some questions for us, please? Yes, of course, Baptiste. So, Pascal, you just saw your satellites separate from Orion 5. Uh, how do you feel? Well, I have to say that I feel uh, absolutely incredible. So we have received the telemetry. I can in even say that I have breathed the quantum sigh of relief, to be honest. It has been a long journey with this satellite, uh, which has met some uh, challenges. Uh, but uh, we're extremely happy to have uh, witnessed this beautiful launch today. Well, thank you. Uh, Utilsat Quantum is what we can call a game changer. What, what is it going to change and how important is it for your company? So Utilsat Quantum is indeed a game changer. It's a satellite of a new type, a flexible satellite, uh, which uh, will be able to, uh, to be controlled in orbit from the ground through uh, software. So that is a great advantage for our client. So coverage and power, spectrum and capacity uh, are going to be reconfigurable uh, at any time. So this uh, makes a, an extremely uh, uh, good use of resources. So uh, it opens also the, the, the door for uh, new applications uh, like data, government and maritime applications. Well, thank you, Pascal. So Elodie, uh, the satellite was developed under a public-private partnership, right? Exactly. So, uh, Quantum Satellite is a satellite that has been developed uh, on a private partnership, public partnership, with uh, the operator Utelsat and uh, the, uh, the Urban Space Agency. So, this uh, public-private partnership allows us to share the risk with the operator and boost the innovation that Quantum, Utelsat Quantum Satellite is carrying on board. 
Okay, so it is really important for the European landscape, right? Yes, so many countries, six countries got together to support the, all the innovation developed on board of Utelsat Quantum. So UK, the Netherlands, uh, Spain and Italy, as well as Norway and Canada, boost their industry and supporting the, to the commercial private actors. In addition to that, we have now uh, Utelsat Quantum that is leading the way of getting towards a software-defined satellites. And there is uh, now the, the next generation of satellites that they are under development with a lot of innovation between the European Space Agency and all the commercial actors. Wow, that sounds incredible. Thank you, Elodie. Uh, so now, Christoph, it has been a long journey for your team. They had to develop brand new technologies for the satellite. How is it to be part of such an incredible journey? Well, it was a very exciting project. I, I would like first to, to thank the Airbus teams in uh, the UK, in France, in Spain, in Italy, in the Netherlands, and as well as the SSTL team for their uh, hard work and dedication throughout the program. The program has been made possible by uh, the very strong support from ISA through this private, uh, public-private partnership, and as well through, uh, thanks to the very constant will of Utelsat to go throughout the, the program. So it has been a very important experience. Now we have received the spacecraft telemetry. We know that we have a, a bit of a critical operation to perform in order to complete the job and, uh, and to go through the early orbit phase and through the in-orbit acceptance. But I'm sure that the Airbus team, along with all the partners, will uh, carry on to uh, bring the customer satisfaction at the high level. <laughs> Well, thank you, Christoph. Uh, now, Pascal, one last word for your team uh, and partners. Well, I would like to thank, obviously, uh, our uh, supplier and partner, uh, Airbus, the teams in the UK and in France who have been working on this satellite for quite some time. I would like also to thank the European Space Agency and the uh, UK uh, Space Agency for uh, having contributed to the funding of uh, the development and uh, construction of the satellite. Uh, of course, our long historical partner, Ariane Espace, uh, who offered us a fantastic uh, launch today. Um, I would like also to, to thank our co-passengers, 1D2 with the team of Marcello uh, who shared the ride uh, with us uh, today and of course uh, the team of Utelsat uh, those who are here with me and those who are also back in Europe who have been working on this uh, satellite now uh, the time has come to go and uh, sell. I have a personal note for Philippe Oliva and my colleague uh, from Utelsat who is the chief commercial officer. Philippe now you have the satellite you can go and sell and I wish Utelsat Quantum a really long, uh, long life and a commercial success. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Pascal. We shared you too. And thank you to you all over there. Thank you, Cyril. Cyril, it looks like it's time now to meet with another special guest. You have a representative with you from Ombretel, is that right? Yes, I'm with Marcello Lavrado, the operator's satellite mission. So, uh, Marcello, what is it like for Ombretel to have another satellite successfully launched? Uh, good evening. You are very proud about the success launch for Star 1D2. A very special moment for us. We just launched a satellite, the biggest satellite that we have, that have a very important role in Brazil and Latin America. I speak on behalf of all team, and you are very happy with the launch. And I would like to thank you, everyone, who participated in this important project to Embratel, claro, especially Ariane and Maxar teams. I'm very happy with this launch. Well, thank you, Marcelo. So, how important is Tower 1 D2 for Embratel and for the market in general? Uh, this satellite is very important to us and the, in the Central and the South America, especially in Brazil, uh, in places where the terrestrial uh, infrastructure does not reach. The satellite has a very important role to connect the people and the business. And the Embratel segment uh, we we start wanting to and I'm very happy with this launch and the uh, long life for our satellite D2. 
Well, thanks again, Marcelo. I know you still have